Turn with us this evening to familiar scripture, Isaiah chapter 9. I'm going to embark on starting to look at what we would consider to be um, Christmas scriptures, I guess, but they're good scriptures for any time of year. This is one of my favorites and uh, thankful that God has, has led us this way this evening. Uh, we'll try to preach on these the best we can. There's no way that I could unpack what Isaiah is saying and, and all the goodness of what God has given him to write in this chapter. But Isaiah chapter 9 is where we'll be. And before we get started, we want to open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to look into your word, to see your son, God, to see the prophecy of your son. Hundreds of years, God, before he would come. Lord, you laid out to your men who he would be, what he would be like, Lord. And Father, as we embark on this season, God, we pray, Lord, to lift up the name of your Son. We pray, dear God, that, Father, if there be any lost that come into the house of God this Christmas season, the Lord, we would show them the way to the cross, and that, God, we might see them saved. Father, we thank you, Lord, we ask it all in Jesus' name, and amen. So Isaiah, Isaiah is definitely one of the most popular uh, messianic prophets that there is. We go to the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, and that is where we see the suffering servant, and actually backed up into the 52nd chapter as well. Here is where we begin, though, with what we would consider the Christmas story. Hundreds of years before Christ would come, God gave this vision to Isaiah. And as this vision is being given to Isaiah, judgment is about to come upon the land of God's people. We talked about it many times. We all know that the Assyrians would come, the Babylonians would come, but God is telling them that if there's going to come a day, there's going to come a time that a Redeemer would come. One of the themes in Isaiah, and not only Isaiah, but in Jeremiah and Ezekiel, is that God would open up His doors to the Gentiles, to us. Here we're given very specifics, though, about the Son of God, and it gives us a little glimpse into who God is and uh, eternity and some of the deeper theological ideas about God. So in the sixth verse of Isaiah 9, it tells us, For unto us a child is born. And that's generally the main focus on the Christmas season, is the baby in the manger, which it is an amazing thing to stop and to think about and to meditate on and dwell upon, because laying in that manger on that first Christmas Whenever Christmas was, we don't actually know the actual day that Christ was born. December 25th is set aside for that. But whatever day it was that he was born, there lying in that manger, because there was no room in the inn, as we're told in the Bible, lied God Almighty wrapped in human flesh, just a little tiny baby thing. It's absolutely mind-blowing to think about, and it's impossible to wrap the human mind around. How can someone be all God and all man? How can a little newborn baby be all God? I don't know the answer to that. No one knows the answer to that. People will try to explain it, but none of us have the explanation because none of us are God. But that's what people see as we enter into the Christmas season, or at least they used to. Uh, we see secular society moving further and further away from the original meaning of Christmas. But that's what many people see. We see the child is born. But you see, it also says something else to us. See, a child is born, but unto us a son is given. Amen. You see, he became the baby in the manger, but he was always the son of God. There was never a time in eternity that he was not God the son. Never a time in eternity that he was not the son of God. When we look into scriptures like this, we begin to think into the deepness of who God is. And when we think about this, born unto us, or unto us a son is given, it gives us insight into the deepness of simple scriptures, like John wrote in 1 John when he said, God is love. You see, John could have wrote, God is loving, and it would have been true. John could have wrote, God loves, and that would have been true. But John was instructed to write by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God is love. That is, that is who he is. It's his nature. Well, see, when we think about that, we must understand that there was a time that none of this existed. There was a time when there was no earth. There was a time when there was no angels. But for God to be love, 
it means that there had to be something to love. Well, what did God love? He loved the Son. The Son was always there. That relationship was always there. And so when the Bible tells us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, don't let that verse that we've been taught since children, don't let the, the wonderfulness and the deepness of that verse pass you over. Amen. Because the love has always been there. When God gave his Son, he gave the very best he could give. Yes. You see, the children, that, that, that's the greatest thing that I have in my life yes. as far as earthly things go. Right after that is my wife. I would lay down my life for any of them in an instant. But I would not give one of their lives for anything or anybody in this world. Could not do it. And yet God looked at us. You know, I was thinking today, doing some personal studying. And I looked to some familiar scripture in Romans chapter 7, verse 24. Where the apostle Paul looked at himself and said, Oh, wretched man that I am. God's seen us. You see, when the Apostle Paul is saying that, when I look at the Apostle Paul, I see a Christian man who is better than me. I'm not on the level of the Apostle Paul. I didn't get caught up into the third heaven. I didn't get blinded by the Lord on the road to Damascus. I'm not an apostle. I'm not any of those things. And so when someone like the Apostle Paul would look at themselves and say, Oh, wretched man that I am, it should make us stop and take note and say, well, if Paul's wretched, I'm probably wretched too. And that's what God's seen. We are all sinners. But you see, God loved us so much, in spite of ourselves, he still sent his son. I seen a quote by Paul Washer last night. Um, if you want to hear some uh, really harsh preaching that will get right under your skin right quick if you're uh, doing any of the things that Paul preaches on, watch Paul Washer on YouTube. Uh, he'll, he'll rake your, your shins really fast. But he said a really, or I read a really good quote of his. It went something like this. If salvation is 99.99% Christ and 0.01% us, we're all damned. And I got to thinking about that. I thought, wow, and that goes exactly to what Tim was saying. It's not us at all. That's right. But as Tim was saying, when there is right faith, there will be works. But you see, the works have nothing to do with the salvation. It's a byproduct of, and Jesus does it all. See, God looked at us and knew we were sinners, and we could not save ourselves. In the very next verse after Paul says, O oh, wretched man that I am, he says, or excuse me, the same verse, he said, Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And that word deliver means rescue. Paul needed rescued. We needed rescued. God sent his son to rescue us. Right. So a child is born, yes, but a son that was eternal was given to us. The next portion of the sixth verse says, The government shall be upon his shoulder. You know, a lot could change in the world. Sister Betty Kaiser used to say, Wouldn't it be wonderful if everyone in the world was a Christian and went to church? And she was right. She had a fairly good point. It would be. Maybe God could just go ahead and change us all and send down the new heaven and new earth and none of the other stuff would have to happen. But, you know, not everyone is saved. Not, not everyone goes to church. And in this world today, we see evilness growing. It's, it's, it doesn't hide in the darkness anymore. It's not kept in the closets anymore. Evil is out there in the open. And you know, the government today, and it's not just our government, it's all governments of the world, today want to get rid of God Almighty. They don't want Him in charge. They don't want His laws. They don't want His precepts. They don't want His word. But I've got news for them. The real king one day is coming back, and the government will rest upon His shoulder. It will be His. He will sit on the throne in Jerusalem, and no one is going to stop it from happening. There won't be any election fraud when he comes back. Amen. Yeah, yeah. The government will be upon his shoulders. And I, I love these, these next few parts. It says, and his name. What we're about to read aren't just titles. It's his name. And his name shall be called Wonderful. Isn't there something wonderful about the name Jesus? You just hear that name or you read it in the word of God. And there's just something wonderful about it. Counselor, the Bible says. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, 
For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace, that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. There is not a greater counselor you will find than the Lord Jesus Christ. He can fix the spots in your life that you thought couldn't be fixed. He can straighten up everything. I remember years ago, I don't even remember if I was preaching yet or not. I don't even think I was preaching yet. We had a fellow attendant here, he and his wife. And um, this guy, was he was a big man. Big man. Mike Sparks was his name. And uh, he worked at Lucasville Prison. He was pretty hard. And, uh, but he kept coming to church. Kept coming to church. And finally one Sunday, he let it go. And this man, who was a very large man, who had worked at Lucasville during the riots, who had, in his own words, had prisoners look at him square in the eye and say, if I ever get out of here, I'm coming after you and I'm going to kill you. And they meant it. This man who was hardened, this man whose marriage was about to fall apart that we would later find out, he took one step out that pew, maybe a, the seat behind Ron, and came walking up that aisle just a-weeping. <laughs> and after he came to the altar, gave his heart to the Lord, I don't think there was a time I ever heard him testify that he didn't weep. This large, large, rough man was brought to be just to have a tender heart now. And he said, you know, he would testify and he would say, my marriage was about to fall apart. He'd say, I'd just become so mean and wicked. He said, but you know, he said, I bet, met the best marriage counselor that I could find. And he said, after I got saved, he said, things got better. He changed that heart of his. You know, everybody in life, even after you get saved, if we said many times, problems and difficulties arise. I'm sure the Apostle Paul, as God used his, his own personal thoughts and experiences as he penned uh, a greater portion of the New Testament, I'm sure at that moment when he wrote, Oh, wretched man that I am, he might not have been having good thoughts about himself. Perhaps as he wrote, Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Perhaps he stopped there for the night. Perhaps he stopped there for a few days. And then the Spirit of God reminded him. And then he wrote the next verse, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Maybe then it hit him. You see, everybody gets down like that. But the one that we can go to, his name is Jesus. Amen. He is the counselor. Amen. He is the mighty God. The Bible tells us, I believe in the book of Colossians, if I'm not mistaken, that without him was not anything made that was made. The creation, generally when we think of creation, we think of God the Father. But yet Christ was right there with him as God Almighty. You see, who God is reaches beyond what the human mind can understand. He is one person and yet manifests himself in three different ways. But yet he's still one. Mind-blowing. Cannot understand it. But if God was, if I could understand God, he wouldn't be worth worshiping with the, with the mind that I've got. Trust me. He is beyond my understanding. He is the mighty God and the everlasting Father. Now, you stop and you think about that, the everlasting Father, but we're talking about the Son of God here. Remember the conversation that Philip and Jesus had when he said, Lord, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. Have I been so long time with you, Philip, that you don't yet know me? He that has seen me hath seen the Father, for I and my Father are one. The greatness of who Jesus is. Isaiah got a little glimpse of it and wrote it down here and said, and he is the prince of peace. In our nation today, we see seemingly things falling apart. I didn't know a police officer got shot in Charleston, only an hour away from here. Horrible news to hear about something like that coming so close to our little town. And we see all across our nation, riots and looting and just absolute depravity of man is all you can call it. 
We can say that they're fighting for social justice and all this and that. Listen, all they are doing is committing acts of sin. That is it, plain and simple. The gospel is not about social justice. The gospel is about getting people saved. And that is all it's about. It's not about all this other nonsense that is happening in the world. Just let me rant here for just a moment because some churches today are trying to take on this social justice gospel. And listen to me, that's not the gospel. The gospel says this, that we are all equal. The gospel says this, we are all sinners. The gospel says we are all on our way to a devil's hell. And the gospel says that if you will repent and believe, you can be saved. Right. And that is for everyone. Amen. There is no difference, the Bible says. You know, with all the chaos we see happening in the world, we look and we hope for a day of peace. The Middle East has been in turmoil for years and years and years, and that goes back all the way to um, Abraham and his sin with um, Hagar. It's continued on up, down throughout all the ages. We, uh, I just read an article, I think it was yesterday, if I'm not mistaken. Basically, uh, someone in Chinese government made the statement that as long as they can keep the Chinese people eating and drinking water and going to the bathroom, then they will always be able to take out the United States. Who knows what's going to happen, but I do know this. I know that when he comes, there will be peace. There will be true peace. The lion will lay down with the lamb. You know what? A child can, will be able to go out and play with them. Um, I'm, I'm kind of a cat person myself. I'd, I'd love to, to grab a lion and hug it, but I'm not going to try right now. I'm going to wait till after a while, till after he comes back. But you know what? You'll be able to do those things. There'll be absolute harmony. People today are looking for a utopia where everything just goes perfectly. Listen, it's not going to come until he comes back. The Bible says this. I'm not going to, I'm going to try to hurry up here. The Bible says this in the seventh verse. And I never caught this until um, the other day when I read this. It says this, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. So this is speaking to the millennial reign, but not only the millennial reign, but it is speaking into eternity, the new heaven and new earth. And what it sounds like, and I'm not saying this is actually what's going on here, but the wording almost makes it sound like the heaven's just going to get better and better. Eternity is just going to get better and better. Notice it says, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. You say, well, how can eternity, how can the new earth, how can, can the new heaven, how can it get any better? I don't know, but if there's anyone that can make something get continually better, it's God. He is that good. And so there's not going to be any end to that. When Jesus sits on the throne, there's not going to be any overturning it. Not going to happen. He says he's going to sit upon the throne of David. You know, we look, people, you know, just like Brother Tim said, there's many skeptics out there in the world, and they almost come right out and say they don't believe in God, but they want to question it, they want to do this. If you want proof of the validity of the Word of God, if you want proof of the validity of Christ, look at Israel. Look at how this little place, no bigger than New Jersey, how all the eyes of the world are upon that place. Yeah. And so many evil nations want to take that place out. Why? Because God's throne resides there. Right. That is why. Jesus will sit upon that throne. I laugh. I remember, it's been a few years ago, but I remember one of the people in Iran, one of the top people, they said that they were going to wipe um, Israel off the face of the map. I thought, it's never going to happen, pal. It's never going to happen. That is God's. You might wipe the United States off the map. You might wipe Canada off the map. You won't touch Israel. I can promise you that. Yeah. Jesus will be sitting there on the throne of David. He will order it. He will establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth forever. And I like this last part as we come to a close. It says, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Amen. The zeal of God will perform this. Look at all of these things here are all things that are good for us. They're beneficial for us. And God's zeal is going to perform this. Tim was talking about he wants to be at church. Why? It's his zeal. He desires it. He wants it. Why is God being so good to us? Why is God giving such wonderful promises to Isaiah that we have seen come to pass in the Lord? 
It's his zeal. He desires it and he wants it. Amen. As you know, as we, as we move into Christmas, yes, we see a baby in the manger, but there is so much more than just a child in the manger. Amen. So much more as we bow our heads. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the time to look at the word of God this evening. Lord, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you, God, for your promises, for your goodness. Lord, as we get ready to uh, offer an invitation, God, we pray, Lord, that if there's anybody that needs to pray or whatever the case might be, you know, I don't know, uh, we just put, turn this over into your hands and we just pray, dear God, that they will call upon you, Lord, and have whatever need that they have met. With every head bowed and every eye closed.